Hi, and welcome to the Working Differently in Extension podcast. I'm Bob Birch. Great to have you along for today's uh, show as we welcome to the podcast Chuck Hibbard. Chuck is the Dean and Director of Nebraska Extension at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. Um, and I've just, uh, full disclosure, been doing a little work with the University of Nebraska Lincoln and uh, learning about some of the changes that they're making in their extension service. And I wanted to invite Chuck on to talk a little bit about that. So welcome to the podcast, Chuck. Well, thanks, Bob. It's great to be here. Important conversations as we try to move extension forward in uh, Nebraska and in the U.S. Well, we'll get to some of the changes uh, at uh, in Nebraska extension, but you know, I'm curious how you got started in, in extension. I know you're a Nebraska native and now you're back home, but what, what was your path that led you to cooperative extension work? Sure. So, yeah, I am a native Nebraskan, a UNL grad. Uh, I did my graduate work at Oklahoma State University and then stayed there on the faculty for about 12 years as a research teaching uh, appointment. Uh, but during that time, uh, the research that I was doing with uh, uh, cow-calf nutrition uh, was apparently interesting to people across Oklahoma and beyond because we, uh, I got involved in, in doing a lot of extension programming, which I really enjoyed, uh, you know, working with producers, uh, interacting with uh, people who are trying to figure out better solutions, better strategies. Uh, that was just really fun. So uh, in 1994, I had an opportunity to come back to Nebraska, to the Panhandle Research and Extension Center. Uh, as a director. So I had uh, 11 counties and uh, about 12 uh, research and extension specialists at that location. And uh, as the administrator, that was the first time I actually had a formal extension appointment. So uh, I was not actually a practitioner coming into that role, but uh, had a great run for 12 years at uh, the Panhandle and then had an opportunity to serve as Associate Dean and Director of Extension at Purdue University for five years. Uh, great opportunity, great experience with a tremendous university and a very, very strong extension program. And then came back to Nebraska about four years ago in a similar role, being a Director of, of, of Extension here in Nebraska. I've really enjoyed uh, my uh, career path uh, in terms of the different kinds of things that I've, I've had the opportunity uh, to be part of. Uh, but more recently, uh, in my role with uh, ECOP, the Extension Committee on Organization and, and Policy, uh, where uh, we talk about uh, the big ideas around extension and, and uh, where extension needs to go. And so that's been a, a, real, uh, a really great experience as I've, I've had that opportunity as well. So that's, that's kind of my uh, career path. That's how I've gotten to where I am today, Bob. So it's interesting that your first uh, official extension appointment was as an administrator. I know that um, uh, I'm sure I'm not the only person in extension who has heard, well, you don't really know what it's like in the counties and having not been, uh, it, you know, as, uh, having an extension appointment before that. Was that something that sort of you faced in terms of uh, kind of coming in without a, a deep extension background? No, absolutely. I mean, you know, I was I was engaged with extension at Oklahoma State, so I kind of knew the structure and how things worked and what county folks did and what the state and regional folks did. I kind of understood that point. But when I moved to Scotts Bluff in 1994, the extension educators located in the counties made it clear to me that I they expected me to be out and about. They expected me to spend time uh, to get to know them, their offices, uh, to uh, uh, to connect uh, with their extension boards and their 4-H councils. And so uh, I took that very seriously. And I, I tried to be a real student of what county-based, you know, highly engaged, fully engaged extension work meant and what it meant for local counties to, uh, to have a university representative or more than one in their midst, uh, bringing the university to the people of Nebraska. So I carried that on when I moved to Purdue. Uh, one of the things that I did, uh, 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 Indiana has 92 counties. I visited all 92 counties in my first 300 days on the job. I made that commitment uh, and I got it done. It was kind of funny. Uh, one of the fun things that happened was uh, they'd, uh, they'd put a photo of me on their front desk. So when people walked through the door, they would know it's me at, uh, because they knew I was coming, but they wanted to make sure they had the right person. So that was fun as well. When you started uh, at uh, UNL, um, Ronnie Green, the vice chancellor for Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources, in the announcement for, for your hire said that you're assuming leadership at a critical time for Nebraska Extension. What, what made that a critical time in 2012? You know, uh, Ronnie Green, as our uh, Vice Chancellor and Vice President for the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources, uh, uh, was a transformative leader. 
And of course, he continues to be a transformative leader now in his new role as chancellor of UNL. But at that time, what was really going on was, uh, and under Ron, Ronnie's leadership, was uh, to bring in a lot of new faculty. In fact, in the last uh, five years at uh, in INR, we've hired 120 uh, new faculty, tenure line faculty. We have another 24 or so that are in search. So. Uh, by the time we're done, about a third of our faculty will be new in the last five or six years. Uh, programs were being uh, uh, redeveloped, reorganized, refocused, uh, big commitment to Nebraska and Nebraskans, and uh, really bringing the Institute of Ag and Natural Resources and our research, teaching, and extension missions closer to the people of Nebraska and what Nebraskans cared about. And so, you know, I always knew from my time in the Panhandle how much Nebraskans care about this university, care about the Ag and Natural Resources programs, uh, care about what we do and the kinds of investments that, that we make. But Ronnie elevated all, all of that. And so there was a great expectation out in the country, which was awesome. We can respond to that. Uh, but there was also a, a pathway forward. And so Nebraska Extension at that time, very strong extension program. We'd come through the recession with no cuts, our strong ag economy, and a drought in Nebraska made commodity prices really good. So um, our tax revenues were good, uh, and the university and extension got through without any cuts. So we were in a good place financially. But we we're also looking at an extension program that was somewhat traditional in the way we approached things and did things. And yes, we have our innovators, absolutely. But Ronnie also recognized that it was an opportunity for strong leadership to really come in and help people rethink the way we do extension in Nebraska. And I've been on that ride now for four years and it's been really fun and exciting. So how's Nebraska extension doing now? My home state in North Dakota, where I am, we have some very some similarities with Nebraska, especially in our reliance on ag and and energy, and uh, those prices uh, uh, have been down over the last year or so. Uh, how is that affecting Nebraska Extension? Sure. So, uh, really, in two ways, and and certainly our our legislature is going into their biennial budgeting uh, process uh, this coming winter, and uh, you know the you know the signs are not particularly good. Uh, so we don't anticipate a cut per se, but we may not enjoy the increases we've had in the last four years that I've been here. But bigger than that, and I think really important than that, is that uh, our farmers and ranchers in Nebraska and across the Midwest uh, are really struggling with low commodity prices. Uh, you know, corn is $2.80, soybeans are 10 bucks. Uh, uh, weanling calves this fall will probably sell for about a, a dollar thirty. Most of these prices are roughly half of what they were at, at the peak a couple of years ago. Uh, they are below the cost of production. So we, as well as a number of states in the Midwest, are gearing up to really be able to help farmers and ranchers who are fa facing financial trouble. Uh, we've done a survey we uh, uh, of almost a thousand farmers and ranchers in Nebraska, and they tell us they got through this year okay, but next year looks really, really difficult, especially in uh, being able to achieve operating loans from the bank. So, you know, uh, the great thing about extension is that we're always there for people when they need us. The great thing about extension is that we are positioned to step up when these kinds of things happen. So whether it be a you know, a drought or a flood or, um, you know, other kinds of extreme weather events or be an economic downturn or whatever it might be, uh, we're going to be there for people. And so that's what we're doing right now, Bob. But uh, like a lot of states is we're gearing up to better engage on the financial management side of ag production and really try to help our ag producers and their families deal with what looks like a long-term downturn in commodity prices. Let's talk about some of uh, the changes that are going on in Nebraska Extension. Uh, you've called this the for Nebraska Extension the year of learner engagement. Mm -hmm. So, what does that mean to you? Can you describe what that means? Uh, learner engagement means to you? Sure, absolutely. And and I would tell you that you know learner engagement is kind of the culmination of, of four or five different changes, uh, evolutions. I keep telling people it's not a revolution; it's an evolution. Some believe it, some don't, but. Uh, you know, evolutions that we've been going through here in Nebraska for the last four years. And so uh, this one, learner engagement, uh, no, it's not a new idea for us. We've been engaging learners for 100 years. And so that's not a new idea. But what we want people to think about is, uh, is that the times have changed. And we have a lot of new tools that we can use. 
that we want to employ. Uh, there are different methods that we can employ. Uh, and uh, I'd say the other part of it is, is uh, you know, the gravity, the seriousness of the, of the issues that we're working with right now uh, are, uh, the gravity is, is higher than ever. And so uh, we want to make sure that we're doing really high quality work in ways that people uh, will appreciate and use that information. So for us, learner engagement really has two elements. And uh, one is to meet learners where they're at realizing that everybody's different on that learning, you know, experience practice continuum. You know, we have new entry level people, they may or may not come to us with a good college education from UNL or whatever Lang Grant University, uh, but they're, you know, they're novices, they're entry level people and we need to be able to meet them where they're at to the full range of the most sophisticated, high level, uh, technology savvy, uh, marketing savvy, whatever, you know, whatever their, their venue is. Uh, you know, the people that are really at the high end. And so we need to be able to meet learners where they're at and provide value no matter where they are in that uh, full range from novice to sophisticated. So that's one point. The second point is that we want to engage learners in ways that they want to be engaged. And we all know different people have different learning styles. Uh, you know, they like to receive information in different ways. Uh, you know, extension for 100 years has kind of depended on the expert model. That's not a wrong idea. In fact, it's a good idea. Our role is to bring the, the science-based information of the Land-Grant University and beyond to the people. That's, you know, that expert model is really important. But the way we deploy that expert model is changing rapidly. And so that's the other thing about learner engagement that we're trying to do in our fall conference this year is all about learner engagement. These ideas about how can we engage learners differently in ways that they value, you, you know, bringing information and helping uh, develop solutions that they will actually use. Do you think that um, there was a period, and, and maybe this is part of this change, where uh, at least in general, I don't want to lump all extension folks into this, but in general, extension sort of came up with a formula of, of knowledge transfer and followed the formula for a long time. You know, specialist creates maybe package program, agent delivers it to a room full of people using a PowerPoint and the cycle, you know, continues. Yeah, no, I, no, absolutely. And, and, uh, and, you know, we got to the point where we're, we're really quite good at that. I mean, a lot of extension professionals are great presenters. They can really engage an audience. And in fact, you know, they look for us uh, to come back every year at uh, Nebraska Cattlemen or whatever the event might be, uh, because we do have people who are uh, global experts in the areas that they work in. And they're tremendous presenters. They really know how to engage an audience. So, you know, there still are going to be those opportunities for that kind of expert model practice. And, and I think that's fine. But I think we did uh, get a little too complacent, maybe a little too comfortable, uh, kind of this one way where we deliver information and the learners are supposed to receive it. And we know that in this day and age, that's not really the way things work. You know, learners are very inquisitive. They're always searching for things. They're doing Google searches or they're talking to their friends uh, or they're on Facebook, some kind of social media but they're gathering information all the time and, and they're thinking about what that information means to them. And, and in some cases, uh, the source is not as important as the quality of the information that they receive. And so uh, what we find, I think, as we move into this century, the second century of extension, is the opportunity to be much more engaged with learners and the idea that it really is a two-way street and that they will learn from us and we will learn from them and together we will uh, generate solutions that are better than we ever could have, have done uh, individually. I had a great experience with this quick short story that uh, I think really, really illustrates this. When I was in the panhandle, uh, we had a really crackerjack sugar beet uh, research and extension team, uh, one of the best on the planet. And so we decided we wanted to challenge sugar beet farmers to see who could grow sugar beets better on their land, the university or the farmer, right? Okay, so this was going to be a fun uh, little kind of competitive deal. And of course, we had all of our technology and all of our knowledge and all of our best practices. And the farmer had the way they grew sugar beets normally. And that was the deal. They weren't to change the way they grew sugar beets normally. At the end of the season, we harvested the sugar beets and the farmers beat us seven out of 10 times. 
and you know, it just reminds us that the people that we work with, the learners that we work with have knowledge and experience that's important to this equation. And if we don't honor that, then we're not honoring uh, uh, their expertise and their interest and, uh, and, and we're not creating a, an element of trust that we think is really important going forward. Yeah, and it, I, I guess I would go a step further and say not just honoring it, but utilizing it. Right. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's knowledge that can be used to help others. Absolutely. And, and you know, that's why I think, uh, you know, these learning circles uh, approaches, the, you know, the working differently approaches that the extension has really been challenging us to think about where, you know, there are a group of people in the, in the room and, and we have a seat at the table and a really important seat at the table, but we're not the only voice and we're not the only expert and we're not the only ones that have had experience. And so uh, it changes the way we think about extension. I think one of the challenges to your point earlier, Bob, is, uh, you know, kind of the old expert model of doing extension in, in reality compared to what we're talking about now was actually kind of easy, right? I mean, you know, we'd use our knowledge and expertise, we prepare a PowerPoint, we get ready, you know, we made sure everything worked, we delivered, uh, we did a survey at the end and we were done and we would move on. This new style of engaged learning, engaged extension is much different than that. It challenges us to be routinely, continuously engaged with learners and in the process probably being a little more vulnerable uh, relative to our knowledge and expertise or our view of the world than we've done in the past. So I think it's a challenge for us, yet I've seen people who are doing this and are generating uh, amazing results. So I think it's another tool that we need to have in our toolbox. Let's talk about uh, another one of the, the changes at Nebraska Extension, and that was the formation of issue teams. What led you to that decision to put together issue-based teams and in contrast to uh, sort of subject matter or topic-based teams. Right, exactly. And, and you know, Nebraska Extension had had a, a strong history of action teams that were focused around subject matter areas and uh, very productive, uh, high-impact programs, uh, you know, things that we we're really, really proud of. And, and, and in that process, I think also – uh, gave extension professionals in Nebraska a reason to work together rather than working independently. And so, you know, that sense of collaboration, that sense of interaction and, and uh, the, the, you know, the kinds of things that can come from uh, active collaboration uh, were really beginning to be valued by a lot of people. They were looking for that. They were seeking that. The challenge, however, was uh, with our action teams is that we were kind of looking inward rather than looking outward. And uh, we realized a couple of years ago that if Nebraska Extension was really going to be effective, we really needed to listen to Nebraskans and, and find out what kinds of things that they thought uh, were really important to them. And so in uh, June of 2015, we did a survey. It was an online Qualtrics survey. Uh, we had almost 2,000 uh, respondents. Uh, and, uh, and by the way, respondents from rural and urban areas, from all different income uh, stratas, uh, uh, from uh, uh, people involved in production agriculture and business and banking and, you know, daycares and, you know, the whole range uh, and good distribution of ages as well. And so we felt really good about uh, the responses that we got. And... Uh, we had a small group of extension professionals we called our directions group, who, by the way, are still operating today to give us direction and help us think about what's next and where do we need to be to continue to be relevant. But our directions group distilled uh, those almost 2,000 responses and helped us come up with 18 issues that uh, uh, they felt were really important for Nebraskans. These were issues that reframe the way we thought about what the what the opportunities were, what the challenges were for Nebraskans. And so uh, 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 that gave us a different way to think about the issues, think about the needs. So uh, we put those 18 issues out to all of our extension professionals in Nebraska. Uh, they were validated wholeheartedly by the group, uh, not really any uh, changes. It was almost amazing that uh, uh, I think our directions group really hit the nail on the head with these 18 issues. So then we went about the uh, process of, of populating issue teams. Uh, so we identified a, a, uh, a forming leader 
uh, to help the team get started. Uh, but we didn't assign people to teams. It was, a, it was a very organic approach to team development. We put out an invitation and people identified the teams that they wanted to be on. And then we also asked them to identify what role they would like on the team. Were they willing to be a core team member helping us uh, develop and deliver curriculum? Did they want to be a teacher? Did they want to be a, an evaluator? Did they want to be an advisor who brought maybe their science to the conversation but would not be active in the development and delivery of extension programs, products, and services? And did they want to be a leader? And people responded in all of those categories for all 18 issue teams. So last fall, October of 2015, we started the process. What was amazing to me, Bob, was that uh, the people that came together uh, demonstrated their transdisciplinary interest in these issues. So we got away from the old subject matter focus to a true transdisciplinary interest in these ish, these 18 issues, which, uh, by the way, people anybody can look at those. They're on extension.unl.edu. If you go down to the bottom of the page in kind of small print, it says employee resources. Uh, it's an open access link. We don't, it's not very high on the page. It's, it's there. Uh, but if you go there, you can see the 18 issues. You can look at our issue teams. You can look at their logic models. Uh, you know, you can see the kinds of things that they intended to do. So last fall, after the teams kind of started to form, we, uh, we sponsored retreats for each team. Uh, their job was to identify outcomes and begin to put together their logic model. Over the winter, they continue to do their work so that by April, we did a review of each issue team, and each, each issue team had a really good, strong plan in place. Uh, of course, we get busy during the summer doing a lot of other things that are now moving back into that program development and moving pro toward program delivery this winter. So our prior work with action teams, I think, really helped our folks understand what it, need, what it means to work in a team. We've just kind of changed the venue. We've changed the focus. We've made them more transdisciplinary. They're meeting and interacting with people that they've never worked with before. I hear lots of good comments about that. And so we're just about to really launch the programming that's going to come from those issue teams. And we're very, very excited about it. What, what would be your vision, Chuck, of, uh, of the – a successful issue team like do you have an idea of what that would look like or or what would come out of it sure so you know I, I think the first thing is that um, you know we worked really hard on outcomes to be really clear on outcomes and and not global outcomes but really more learner centered learner focused outcomes uh, that helped us really think about then what the evaluation needs to look like. We're trying to follow good extension practice here where you ad identify the issue, you, you clearly uh, develop a learner-centered, learner-focused outcomes, and then you build your evaluation uh, around that, and then you build your program. And so, you know, one of the, uh, one of the success markers for us is, is our process really good? Are we following good process? Are we really focused on outcomes and the kinds of programs that we need to deliver uh, to address those outcomes? Secondly, uh, you know, in some cases, we're gonna use uh, current programs, products, and services, and that's fine because we have some robust programs, products, and services that we really believe in and, and have been tested and are, and are valued. But we also know we need to develop new uh, and innovative programs, products, and services. And so we've really challenged our issue teams to think differently about that. Each issue team has a coach from our extension leadership team. So they're connected with uh, our extension leadership, but we're challenging them to think about innovation and how they engage learners differently. And we have a small grant program uh, and a new, uh, that's focused on innovation, another one that's focused on new, gener uh, new audiences. And so between those two, if they need funding to support new ideas for new programs, new curricula, new approaches, we'll fund that. Uh, so we, we're trying to provide resources to that. And then I think the third part, and, and so as those programs, you know, as that innovation begins to show, up, show itself, uh, that's another success marker for us. And then the third area that's really important, and we're so pleased to have Dan Cotton back in Nebraska, and uh, he, did, he did a great job with the extension. Uh, when he was ready to move on, we said, Dan, we want you back, and, and he's done a great job for us to help us think differently about how we develop and deliver extension programming. And so Dan's really helped us in that regard. 
have a technology 2020 plan. That's a lot of things about technology, but it's also a lot of things around teaching and learning and innovation and all those kinds of things. So that's another success marker for us. Is our innovation then resulting in high quality, highly engaging extension programs, products and services that our learners value at the end of the day, we certainly expect those evaluation efforts that we do to demonstrate that that in fact is true. What, what have been the challenges in, um, you know, these changes? Uh, I'm sure they're, you know, uh, it, we'd love it all if it was all went smoothly and was widely accepted. And, um, but have, the, have there been particular challenges maybe that you didn't expect uh, in, in making these changes? Yeah, you know, there's there's always uh, challenges, and there's always early adopters and late adopters, and heck knows, you know, there you know, it, there's a full range, and and I respect everybody wherever they're at. Sometimes the heck knows are right, and we need we need to listen to them, right? So uh, that's okay. I expect people to to speak up, but you know, I think the work that we've done around action teams uh, before the issue teams uh, positioned us to be more successful because this whole idea of, of, of teamwork and collaboration and synergy uh, has become part of our culture. And so that wasn't necessarily new. I think one of the biggest challenges that we face is that uh, uh, people get really comfortable doing what they've always done and they get busy in doing what they've always done. And so uh, having uh, the courage and the sense of purpose to maybe walk away from some of those things that we've done for a long time, some things that in fact could genuinely be transferred to someone else and they would continue the program, which is to me a success. Um, But having the courage and the willingness to do that has been a challenge. you know, uh, Nebraska Extension, I think like any other extension system, is full of people who care about their clients, who care about learners. And so we're responsive to our learners, to our clients, to stakeholders, to decision makers. And so, uh, you know, if you're going to be responsive, then that means you have to work really hard to carve out time to work on new things. And so I think like anyone, as, as you try and operate in a busy world, how do you decide how to allocate? allocate your time. I think one of the things we have succeeded at at some level, Bob, is that our issues that we're working on and the issue teams that are that have formed, many of our people are so passionate about those issues and passionate about the work and passionate about the, the innovation that's coming from that work that they are making that choice to walk away from some things that have been traditionally highly su- successful and they've received a lot of gratification from doing and uh, moving towards this. The the last thing I'll mention, and I think it's true for all of us, uh, some of us are really better at innovation and others are not. We all have our strengths. I think we, uh, you know, we're still working to try and help people understand that we, we honor them, we respect them from wherever they're at in kind of that innovation uh, continuum or that technology usage continuum. We're providing resources to help them uh, learn and grow in that process. Uh, But we also expect them to try. And so, uh, you know, I think that's true of of, uh, a lot of groups of people. Uh, Some come faster, some come slower. But I'm pretty confident that everyone is trying and uh, trying to engage, trying to improve, trying to contribute in a more productive way. So, you know, those are kind of challenges you have, you know, as a leader, Uh, you have to be patient, right? Uh, These things take time. What we're really doing here, I think, in Nebraska is we're changing, we're evolving our culture. And culture is a hard thing to tackle. If you're going to do that, you need to be really serious about it and have some really good uh, processes in place to deal with that because you don't want to disenfranchise your folks. At the same time, we all know that change is going to happen and that our opportunity is to jump in and, and be part of it. Let's um, talk a little bit about uh, Cooperative Extension nationally um, as we come to the end of our conversation here. Um, yeah, I've been working with Extension for about eight years now. Uh, it seems like the whole, my, whole of my career has been a time of sort of questioning and, uh, you know, the relevancy of Cooperative Extension. Then we, we sort of looked forward and looked back during the, the centennial, during the 100th anniversary. So there's, it seems like there's been, uh, 
at least from my view, more talk about this lately, about how cooperative extension may need to be transformed. What's your view about cooperative extension nationally? Is it in a good place? Do we need to go a different direction? No, I, I think in general we're in a good place, but we also have key opportunities that we really need to address. You know, uh, uh, Bob, one of the things that I've had the opportunity uh, to work on through ECOP is a what we're calling a national system study, which is really to, to kind of poll all the extension directors across the country and say, you know, what are the kinds of things that we can all agree on are important and we might be able to work together, recognize that each state or each system has local initiatives that uh, are important to them and might be unique to their, you know, to their ecosystem or their, you know, their community, whatever it might be. What we've learned from that work, a couple of things that I think are really important, and one is that really the core values of extension and extension work still are in place, and we still hold true to those. The idea that science and being connected to the land-grant university system is, is, is core to the work that we do, and that science brings better solutions. We just got to figure out how to communicate that and share that and, and give people confidence to try things. Uh, so that's one. Uh, secondly, the idea that there are a number of things that we can, in fact, agree on and work on together. Uh, every extension system in the U.S. has 4-H, for example. We all believe in youth development. We may all do it a little bit differently in our system, in our state, in our, in our region, uh, but we all believe in 4-H in, uh, and we all believe in youth development. Many of us work in areas like master gardeners. Uh, uh, many of us are involved in pesticide applicator training. So, you know, there are a number of commonalities, but there's also some very rich differences. And so, as we go forward, uh, and, and you know, every state, every system is in its own place uh, dealing with its own constraints and opportunities, and, and we respect that. But as we go forward, we really want to build on this opportunity to think about system level um, issues and system level opportunities. And so, uh, you know, there's a number of people that are working right now on this uh, Healthy Food Systems, Healthy People Initiative. And, uh, you know, there are potentially big funders who are interested in thinking about how they support that with the understanding that Extension as this highly effective educational organization can deliver programs around healthy food, healthy, healthy egg systems, healthy people across the entire U.S. And so that requires buy-in from each state. Well, every state's in a different place. So that's a big conversation that we're going to have at our National Extension Directors and Administrators meeting in September up in uh, Wyoming. So I think those are the kinds of things. And so, you know, our extension systems, uh, many have been really riddled by budget cuts. We understand that. Uh, some are going through that still yet today. Others are thriving in different ways. Uh, there are new opportunities. Uh, uh, roughly uh, a fourth of our budget here in Nebraska comes from grants, contracts, and other outside revenue. It's really important to us because it allows us to grow our program in ways that we've never been able to do so before. So those kinds of opportunities. So, Bob, I, you know, I'm really hopeful and, um, and, and positive about the future of extension. I think we're all challenged to think about how we do things differently. That's why I really uh, appreciate uh, Chris Geith and her leadership for e-extension and all the work that you and others have done to help us think differently about how we do extension because we've got to be cutting edge and we've got to think about how we do things in ways that people are willing to accept information and think about how it works for them. So we all have the same challenge and I think we can all uh, really be better together as, as we collaborate to move extension forward in the U.S. So I'm, I'm very, very optimistic, but we've got a lot of work to do. Well, Chuck, I want to thank you for your, your leadership in Nebraska and, and nationally in the Cooperative Extension System and for joining us today on the podcast. Thanks, Bob. It's great to be part of these conversations. They are really important. Thanks for providing the venue. Chuck Hibbert is the Dean and Director of Nebraska Extension at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln. You've been listening to the Working Differently in Extension podcast. Please follow us on Twitter. We'd love to hook up with you there. It's at WD in EXT. You can hear us on SoundCloud, soundcloud.com slash workingdifferently, and show notes are at bobbirch.com. Thanks again for joining us. We'll talk to you soon.